My name is Stephen Metcalf, Metcalf and Metcalf. We're a Manhattan-based law firm on Park Avenue. And the two biggest pleasures of my career and being an attorney are working on wrongful convictions with Marty Tanklin. And when a case such as Matthew Zimmerman came across or presented itself at my office, and I saw the similarities between Matthew and Marty, I knew that we absolutely not only had to work on this case, but we had to keep working on this case for however long it took until we ultimately achieved the goal of walking this man out of jail. And that is the reason why we're all here today. Yeah. So, I thank everyone, especially Michelle, Richard for even getting us involved in this Matthew Zimmerman case because everybody who's sitting here tonight is going to look back on this day and say, wow, they called it. They called it. And I don't I can't say what it is, what that linchpin is going to be that turns that turns this case completely around, but it's going to happen very soon. And that's what tonight is about. Tonight is about explaining how, it, it doesn't matter how long it's taken to get to this point. It, what matters is the people who truly care and truly support one particular individual and how they're gonna keep fighting and how they're not gonna stop for however long it takes. And the true, the true testament to that story is not only true family, it's also the man standing next to me as well. Because this is what gets a team involved, and it takes a team, it takes an army, not only to raise a child, but to actually get a wrongful conviction. And that's what we're looking for, specifically in Matthew Zimmerman. So without further ado, the case that really drew parallels to Marty's case that really got our interest in why we're standing here tonight and why we're never going to give up is Matthew Zimmerman. And that case that drew it, that those parallels is Marty's case. And he's working on this case as well. Thank you. So in 1990, I was not known as Marty Tankler. I was known as 90T3844. And that was because I was convicted, wrongfully convicted of the murder of my parents. And I was sentenced to 50 years to life. Um, thankfully, after, and I says thankfully, after almost 18 years in prison, I was finally freed, uh, I was exonerated, I went on to get my law degree, and I'm a lawyer in New York, I'm also an adjunct professor at Georgetown and Toro Law School. I represent individuals in Ohio, a death penalty case in Texas, Matthew Zimmerman, and a number of other individuals. And the reason why I do this is that there should be no other Marty Tankliffs, there should be no other Eric Riddicks. Wrongful convictions is an epidemic that this country has to address. If anybody thinks that the system can convict one particular race, one particular religion, one particular individual, you're dead wrong. We convict white, black, purple, Spanish, African, Indian, Mexican, with no discrimination whatsoever because the most powerful law firm in every single jurisdiction is what? Yes. The government. government. Correct. That is because they have subpoena power, arrest power, wiretap power. They can kidnap your ass, throw you in jail, and basically throw the key away. Yes. And I say that in every wrongful conviction case, Really what we're doing is we're kidnapping innocent people at the hands of the government. What takes is really an army because by the time my case came to light, I had five major law firms, I had private investigators, I had public relations people working on my case. I had family, I had friends. And if anybody thinks it's a small task, go home, go to sleep, wake up, and realize you're dead wrong, okay? 
it really is an army of people. You know, if you didn't think that you need to bring other people on, why did you reach out to Steve, me, Ed? Okay, and guess what? You saw who was here tonight, Eric Riddick. Eric Riddick is on board now. Okay, the team from Matthew Zimmerman will continue to grow. Yes, it will. What you saw tonight was I showed you two documentaries that are done by my students at Georgetown. Yeah. Okay, and through what I do at Georgetown, I've developed a network of experts around the country who get involved in these cases. I will start reaching out to them to see how they can get involved in Matthew's case because each one of these cases is really made by the experts, okay? Listen, Steve and I and Ed, we could be the best lawyers in America. If there's no evidence, if there's no new witnesses, there's nothing we can really do, right? What these cases really start to become about is finding new witnesses, new evidence, and sometimes it's going back to the original case and really uncovering what was withheld. Because in so many wrongful conviction cases, and you can go to the National Registry of Exonerations and look this up for yourself. Brady violations. Brady violations are where the government withholds not just exculpatory information, it's information favorable to the accused. That can mean documentary evidence, it can mean witnesses, it can mean oral statements. A witness could come into the DA's office and said, I saw something. The DA's office may not memorialize it, but they have to turn it over to the defense, right? And that's what can make or break some of these cases. As we know, Larry Krasner's office has recently indicted certain detectives, okay? This is a start to the system. I'm working on another case where we recently got somebody out and the main witness in that case was just indicted for the perjury in that case. That is because the times are changing. We as a society are starting to wake up and realize that the road to solving, quote unquote, solving cases was really false confessions, yeah. inducing witnesses to testify favorably, giving deals to witnesses, bad forensics, bad prosecutors, and bad cops, okay? And if you look at wrongful conviction cases, there's a consistent pattern in every one of them, right? Either ineffective assistance of counsel, okay? And in Matthew's case, we had a double homicide case, okay, that Steve and I spoke about this, that we said, I can't fathom any double homicide case where you wouldn't try it before a jury, where you could at least argue reasonable doubt. I'm working on another Pennsylvania innocence case where the individual's murder trial was two days long. Okay? I asked a number of New York attorneys and they, you know what they told me? They said we couldn't get through our introductions in two days, let alone jury selection. How did they try this entire case to verdict in two days? Okay? And what we need to do is start joining a grassroots movement among the media. Because what ends up happening is every time there's an article that comes out in wrongful conviction cases, and every time, quite often, okay, a new witness comes forward. Or a witness will come forward and say, I have some information, are you aware of this, right? There's a book written many years ago, I think it's called Quote 302, about a Chicago Police Department that had two files. One was the public file, one was the secret file. Just so happens in this one case, an officer retired, and he couldn't understand why a certain individual was still going to trial. He went to court one day, he goes up to the defense lawyer, he goes, how come you're not using this information? He goes, what are you talking about? He goes, I generate all this information. Lo and behold, they found out that there was a secret file. When you have a change in regime in prosecutor's offices, a lot of times you gain access to documents and information that was withheld for years, right? It happens time and time again. It happened in my case. It's happened in almost every case I've been involved with where all of a sudden, five, 10, 15, 20 years later, we submit a FOIA request or freedom of information, and all of a sudden we start getting access to documents. We start learning that documents don't exist anymore. And when the documents don't exist anymore, you start to question why don't they exist, right? 
I'm working on another Pennsylvania case where the prosecutor has been opposing DNA testing, right? And there's a real simple philosophy. If you're not afraid of the truth, don't oppose DNA testing. Really, it's really that simple, right? And in Matthew's case, when we reach out to the district attorney and we request a meeting, which I have done already, okay, we expect to have a meeting, okay, and have a free-flowing exchange of information, and hopefully they'll be open-minded. But there's a way to make sure there's a continued interest, and that is continued public awareness of these cases, right? Uh, a friend of mine, Lonnie Sori, uh, who's worked on the West Memphis Three case, uh, if anybody lo looks at the West Memphis Three case, the Dixie Chicks, Johnny Depp, Eddie Vedder were all involved in that case. And Lonnie was brought on to kind of do the public relations, but really he was brought on to educate the public. When the issue became about possibly retrying the three individuals, the prosecutor ended up coming up to him and saying, we can never try this case because you tampered with the jury pool. Mm -hmm. Now, think about that. You tamper with the jury pool. No, what Lonnie did was he educated the public. That's what we have to do. So much of the public does not really understand the criminal justice system, doesn't understand the faults with it, doesn't understand the problems with it. And when you start studying wrongful convictions, you understand those problems, right? You know, we've also learned how technology has saved some of our youth, okay? For years. Okay, and I can say this because I was in prison with a lot of people, right? That a lot of black, Hispanic, and other minorities would say, the cops rolled up on me, they beat me up, they set me up, right? I know it existed because it happened to me, but I was also in prison with them, right? Technology is our friend nowadays, right? Because we're starting to expose so much of what goes on, right? I worked on a case in Nassau County where African-American defendant comes into the law firm, says, I was getting pulled over, these detectives jumped in my car and beat me up. Everybody said, come on, come on, how ridiculous is that? What do you think saved him? There was a video the cops didn't know about, okay? And when the video came out, basically it established exactly what he said. But there's a bigger problem. The defendant or the accused was never charged. The cops were charged, but guess what? They were found not guilty which really brings this kind of distrust in the system. But what we have to accept is that even when something like that happens, the more we get it out to the public, the more we're educating the public of what can happen in the criminal justice system. And if anybody thinks the criminal justice system is just, it's wrong, okay? It really is more about an injustice system, and we're learning about this. Uh, just a few final things. How many exonerations do you think take place on an average year across America? Anybody? 12. More than that. 100 to Hundred? maybe, let's say 150, 160. What does that translate into? That translates into somebody being exonerated every about three days. And why that should scare you is what does that tell you? What that says is that the guilty parties have remained free in your community to commit additional crimes because the prosecutors and the police didn't do their jobs. So when you hear that a murder has been committed in your neighborhood on a Saturday and all of a sudden Monday the police said, oh, we've arrested the person who committed the murder. What's going to be your first question? How do we know? What evidence do you have? We need to start demanding accountability because so often we're complacent. We accept what law enforcement and the prosecutors tell us because they're prosecutors, they're law enforcement, we're supposed to trust them. We're supposed to believe in them, right? Thankfully, there's a movement. There are some progressive prosecutors across America. Uh, Ken Thompson, when he was alive, was one of them. Uh, Eric Gonzalez is another one. Uh, Larry Krasner is another one where we're starting to see that the new regime hold no allegiance to the former administration. Tim Sinney in Suffolk County, the same way. No allegiance to Tom Spoda, who was just sentenced to five years, is on his way to prison himself, okay? But what we have to do is continue educating people. Go to the websites, understand why these cases happen, 
So we can tell our friends, we can tell our associates, right? Uh, there's a great website, makingandexonery.com, which wasn't working tonight, but there's a technical glitch, where you can actually watch some short videos that my students have done about other wrongful conviction cases. You can go to the National Registry of Exonerations, which has documented every wrongful conviction, I think, since 1989. Um, and they're over, like, I think it's over a thousand wrongful convictions. You can go to the Innocence Project. Um, what you need to do is understand why this happens to make sure it doesn't happen again. And the one last thing, do your civil duty, become a juror if you can, and demand accountability during that process. You know, so often we talk about how do we get out of jury duty, but in most cases, innocent people don't go to prison, okay, without jurors because most people have jury trials. And if jurors are more educated and have a better understanding of the criminal justice system and demand more evidence, more accountability, not have an automatic trust in law enforcement, I think we'll have a lot less wrongful convictions. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.